כל הכבוד, עקיבא. חג שמח! Do we need to like have some coffee or do a little stretches to wake up from our Seder which went late last night? All right, so everyone just take a moment, stretch out because I have a 25 minute sermon to share with you. So I need you awake for this. All right, not 25 minutes, but a few minutes. Uh, and I want, you, I want you with me here. <clears throat> so the people gathered at the sea, they crossed the water and they made their way to the shore. No, these were not the shores of freedom because when they arrived, they were bound and chained and sold into slavery. As you can tell, I'm not speaking about the Israelites leaving Egypt, but of enslaved people from Angola being forcefully taken to this country. The year was 1619 when a Portuguese slave ship traveled across the Atlantic with a hull full of captive Africans. Taken to Jamestown, these 20 to 30 people were most likely put to work in tobacco fields. Thus began a transatlantic commercial slave trade that turned people into commodities and forever shaped their lives and the life of this nation. A debate about the significance of this seminal moment in American history brings into, brings into focus a fundamental message of Pesach. But before we turn to the Haggadah, I wanna say a word about a current debate regarding the origins of this country. The debate centers around the significance of that date, 1619, you see, over the last few years, scholars and activists have described that year, not the 4th of July, 1776, as the beginning of this nation. And they created what's called the 1619 Project, whose goal is, quote, to reframe American history, making explicit how slavery is the foundation on which this country is built. Well, as you might guess, this approach to telling American, the Americans, America's story, it's drawn much criticism. The issue is not the literal date when we mark our independence. American independence is and will always remain on the 4th of July. Rather, this is a debate about the nature of the story we tell about America. Here then are the two sides or the two stories that one might tell about America. One argues that our nation's ideals of liberty and equality were false when they were written by Thomas Jefferson. Inequality was the defining feature of our society beginning back in 1619 and it remains so today. Others, however, point to progress that we have made. Slavery was legal in 1619, although it was of course wrong. The 1776 declaration that quote, all men are created equal marked significant if insig insufficient progress that has continued to this day, even if we have fallen short of truly living out that vision. The debate about American history brings to mind an underlying principle of our own Exodus story. I wanna to get to that principle in a, in a moment, but first let me remind you that we have our own debate about our own people's origins. As you know, Haggadah means telling, and so this should be pretty obvious, but what exactly is the story that's told? It's not a silly question because the truth is the Haggadah doesn't actually include the story. For example, we don't really go back and read from Sefer Shmot, from the book of Exodus. The Haggadah essentially assumes that we know the story and instead shares with us Midrashim interpretations of the story. So. We know that the Haggadah tells the story of slavery, but when does that story actually start? Like our current debate about when America was founded, 1776 or 1619, the Talmud debates the origin of the Israelites' slavery. We read in the Talmud, Shmuel, a second century Babylonian sage teaches, begin the story with, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and the Lord brought us out. And of course, that's exactly what we do at the beginning of the Seder when we sing, Abadim Hayinu, Hayinu, the Pharaoh Bemitraim, Bemitraim. A different second century Babylonian sage, Rav, however, says, No, 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 no. Begin with a different story. Our ancestors worshiped idols, but God 
drew us near. And indeed, that's exactly what we do in the Seder. Just after Abadim Ainu, we say, Mitkla Ovde Avodazara Hayu Avotenu. Your fathers lived on the other side of the Euphrates, and Terach, father of Abraham, and Nahor, they served other gods. These two starting points emphasize two different forms of liberation. For Shmuel, say, slavery from Egypt was about physical redemption. For Rav, being enslaved to idols required spiritual liberation. Well, there's more to say about this Talmudic debate, but about this one point, everyone agrees. The general arc of the story. As Jews, we might not agree on the starting point of the Passover story, but we do agree on the general storyline. In the language of the Mishnah, begin with shame, with degradation, and end with praise. Matchilim begnut umisaimim b'shevach. In other words, if someone were to say to you, do you want the good news first or the bad news first, the Haggadah says, tell me the bad news first. For Rav, the disgraceful thing was acknowledging that our ancestors believed that statues were God. Conversely, to be free, one must acknowledge that wood and stone do not control your life. Given the fiasco of Cheta Egel, the golden calf, that spiritual freedom is a lesson that the Israelites needed to learn long after they were physically freed from slavery. For Shmuel, on the other hand, that physical slavery, that was the very disgrace. The worst thing we suffered, he argued, was to be treated as less than human. Where, we, where should we start with the Pesach story, with stones or with Pharaoh, with idols or with slavery? In good Jewish fashion, we say, you're right and you're right, and we include both in the Haggadah. So in America, we're debating 1776 or 1619, and we would do well to learn the Jewish attitude, you're right and you're right. For by holding on to both of them, we affirm the principle, begin with disgrace and end with praise. This is what I mean. Those that champion 1776 say that our disgrace was that our American ancestors fled their homelands because of religious persecution or war or poverty. They fled to these shores to begin life anew. They can learn from the 1619 Project that an additional and perhaps even greater disgrace was that our ancestors bought and brought human beings and enslaved them to create a viable economic base for these United States of America. That is Matilim Begnut, beginning with disgrace. Misaimim B'Shevach, end with praise, we're taught. To end with praise, we must acknowledge that beginning in 1776 and continuing in the Civil War and with the civil rights, that we have made much progress. At the same time, much work remains. For the greatest praise requires that we address ongoing and systemic racism and inequality in our nation to make the reality match our ideal set forth in that very declaration. To conclude, I wanna reflect on the significance of this as an overarching storyline, because that narrative arc is not obvious. It's not a given. Why begin in shame and end in joy? In his commentary on the Haggadah, Rabbi Jonathan Zach, Sichron Olivracha, explains that this is the quintessential Jewish story. It's the storyline of the Torah itself, but it's really the storyline of Jewish history. Now, other people, they write different kinds of stories. For example, some write tragedies. In tragedies, bad things happen, but for no particular reason. Now, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of tragedy in Judaism, Jewish history has been written in tears, but that's not the story that we tell. Ours is a story of hope. We begin in despair, but we end in praise. Other peoples, they write fairy tales that end and they lived happily ever after. Jewish stories don't end that way. The Torah ends with the people overlooking Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. That's because in the Jewish narrative, the battle against evil, the struggle to improve and to repair, it is never over. To end in praise is not to say mission accomplished, 
It is to give thanks for the progress so far, but there's more to do. The Messiah has not come yet, perhaps Lashana Haba next year, God willing, next year indeed. There are tragedies and there are fairy tales, and then there is the Jewish story. In his commentary on the Haggadah, Rabbi Sachs writes, the Pesach story, begin with shame, end with praise, is the archetype of the Jewish reading of history. Its insistence on rescuing a thread of meaning from catastrophe, its refusal at times heroic to be demoralized by defeat, to give in to the siren call of despair. In the rejection of myth and tragedy, optimism and pessimism alike, the Jewish narrative does not ask us to believe in a world in which there are simple happy endings, nor does it allow us to take refuge in the cynical belief that every aspiration ends in failure. Rather, he concludes, ours is a story of hope. Hope is not naive, hope demands. Hope creates, hope is the expression of the indomitable moral courage. May we as Jews and as Americans acknowledge our disgrace and may we learn from it. May we recognize how far we have come and how far we still have yet to go so that not only do we praise with words, but our deeds sing our praise. Chag Sameach. Yashar Koach, Yashar Koach. We'll turn back to our seat.